a very warm good evening to all of you it's nearly evening i believe and thank you so much for the wake up call that we had uh, so today as uh, we were just discussing and the context was being said the topic we are going to talk about is csr compliances so at the end of the day it's the compliances that matter and we all know that so of course intent is foremost important sustainability esg they are still evolving and uh, uh intent is something which is more critical over there from the international uh, arena as well but uh, i think somewhere we all should be thankful to the indian government for mandating csr law in india india is the first country to have mandated it uh, not that there was no csr before 2014 yes corporates were engaging into it but it has given more uh, strategy more organized the framework is more set now and uh, we all know what to do how to do when to do and all of that but then of course with the ever evolving nature of the law that we have been again hearing about uh, latest amendments are there a lot of changes are there but then again the law is very very young and i believe it's growing organically you know so uh, we are expecting dr garima before she comes we would just have a quick recap of what has happened in last few years from 2014 till now with nikhil sir over here with us the one who was part of iica nfcsr the team who was part of the uh, law who drafted the law and the bills when it was being drafted and what was going behind the scene at that particular point of time so sir i would like to understand from you we all know the law came into being on uh, 1st of april 2014 it was a uh, very very unstructured i would say at that point of time comply or explain was the funda over there at that point of time that okay certain companies would come under the purview of csr you have to spend 2% you have to partner with the ngo you have to give it to the ngo and you has to do it no timelines as such were there and uh, but still it was a landmark decision again because india was the first one to have mandated it so we'll start the session before that i would also like to let you all know that please be ready with your questions because if it comes to both of us i think for us we can talk about law how it evolved what is happening so wherever we may take a break after every 10 minutes or so and we can take up your questions as well over there but sir i would like to understand what was it why uh, india was you know because being the first is always difficult and uh, something like this which was not being followed anywhere in the country in anywhere in the world and india was doing its bit in the csr terminologies if i say gandhian of philosophy of trusteeship was already embedded there from pre independence era or so but what happened in those 2 3 years and how did the law actually evolve what was the thought behind mandating csr so uh, uh, first of all very uh, um, warm uh good day to everybody uh, i guess the weather is a little better today we can breathe a little better in delhi uh, uh extremely grateful to be part of the hcl foundation's journey here and i was listening to nidhi in the morning and kind of interacting with a lot of colleagues here from the foundation that exactly 2 years ago when we had met here prior to covid and today when we are interacting it seems that the foundation's work has gone to another orbit and uh, when i see this as an outsider who's also working with with the foundation very closely and to then relate that to surbi your question i will contextualize both because here we are um, working uh, with a set of partners that the foundation engages with and in 2012 the the company's bill was floated and uh, if you go back uh, in the 1954 i think was the company's act the previous one and a lot had happened through the years in the early 1990s liberalization had happened and a lot of corporates were able to you know jack up their businesses while the corporate sector developed massively and then the it boom also happened during the 1990s and the 2000 and we can see so many of the indians you know uh, heading these corporates global corporates today somewhere the government felt that the social sector program that the government was running which was the taxpayers money because this is all shareholder value that was getting created with technology boom and all happening it there was a discourse that how can we get corporates to get involved in the development process also and that is the core seed that led to the inclusion of a very special section called section 135 within the 
new company the amended companies act 1956 was changed because of liberalization and then the 19 um, sorry 2013 act came in and it was enacted through the lok sabha rajya sabha and then the presidential assent and it actually was then rolled on the 1st of april 2014 as you said so the seeding was the change in liberalization and also the fact that government wanted corporate expertise in the form of some formula which is that 2% formula you're all aware about the 2% i hope uh, that is where section 135 was made part of this new bill and then it rolled out from 2014 first april onwards now with this 2% the idea was that can corporates when they are giving this 2% bring in their innovation their technology their project management skills their uh, their approach to impact like the way they do in business can that be brought into the social sector so that you can have good return on investment which could be called social return on investment and that is from where we began in 2000 Uh, 14th, 1st of April, and you know, for the topic of this session is the various amendments that have come in, um, the annual action plan, and a lot of things that have happened all the way that we would like to discuss in this section, or in this session. It is important for all of us here to understand, and I think Santosh also mentioned that a bit in the beginning that as in, um, uh, a legislation evolves, the ecosystem also begins to align. True, and. Uh, all of you today are not just partners in implementation but you're also partners in compliance so for each one of you to understand compliance is very important and for ngos to understand this is it is even more important as a core strategy of fundraising if you want to raise funds you need to be not just expert in your core area thematic area of education health environment skilling whatever but also understand compliance very well when you approach uh, a corporate csr so all of that is related surbi and uh, uh, if and in fact that is where the etsil foundation academy can can we have people raising their hands those who have done some courses on csr from the etsil foundation academy so we have quite a few of our students also over here and you would have seen how the foundation is trying to to bring that learning from the mandate of the law with your experience on the ground to give you a practitioner's experience so it is all interrelated surbi and right. uh, yeah right. in fact we have few of our students who were not partners with us before the course and they became partners of excel after they did the course with us so big round of applause for all of them and for the academy so yes we are brand ambassadors for academy and we strongly believe and firmly believe that compliance with elements have to be understood by each of the ngo and each of the partner each of the stakeholder and we are at hcl is taking a active step towards it in fact today i am expecting dr garima to be here and this is one of the primary area where i would be talking to her that how government is planning to disseminate the knowledge among the ngos among the partners that would be one of the major questions i'll be putting her over there Okay, so many of you who are new to the sector, new partners with us. I'll just again going forward from 2014 when the law came into force. As I said, it was little unstructured, as in compliances were not very tight at that point of time. So corporate the uh, load or bulge of compliance, if I say, was only on the corporate. And as Sir said, eventually with the reforms, with the latest amendments, the NGOs they have become partners in compliances as well. So how did this actually happen? How did this growth actually happen? So in 14, the law came. It was decided that a year later, a high level committee would meet and see how the law is being implemented on the ground. They'll give the feedbacks and the reviews. In the 15th, the law was very very nascent. They decided. Said okay, let's catch up after three years. Let's meet after three years. Three years later, again, um, committee was formed. A high-level committee was formed, comprising of CSOs, government, private sectors, all the various stakeholders. And on the basis of that, they came up with certain recommendations in 2018, which were open for the uh, coming comments in 2019, just before the COVID kicked in. so uh, you know that was the time because of covid i think it was lost somewhere though it created some buzz over there so i'll just take a break and welcome dr garima <laughs> welcome ma'am come 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 i know where you know please so welcome on the panel we were just setting the context and talking about how the law evolved and it came into being on 2014 and then how it all evolved and uh, high level committee's recommendations were made which were put to the public for their feedbacks and all and then 
bam in january 2021 we had amendments which actually changed the whole scenario you know before it was comply or explain you have 100 rupees spend 70 rupees you are not able to spend 30 rupees just let us know why you could not spend i gave the money to my ngo my ngo will be spending it as per the convenience not that ngo was not spending it yes they were spending it but those strict timelines were not there you know so from 2014 till 2021 those partnerships between corporates and ngos were developed the foundations came up uh, old uh, business houses they had their own foundation uh, they started giving money to them that and allocation was considered as utilization this is a very very important line and i think most of us has suffered because of that and have not understood and where actually you know it, i remember many of the ngos saying that why do you need the money back this is how we have been doing you don't trust us or what no that is not the scenario the compliances has become tighter now the government said by 31st of march you have to spend if you are not able to spend take back the money and report it to us how much you gave how much was spent how much is spent how much is unspent what is an ongoing project there is a duration somebody was are saying that we are scared of the exit plan we don't want to hear the exit plan so take it in a positive manner that exit plan is for this program the moment you exit from here you enter somewhere else so after 3 to 4 years it is basically to understand that is that plan is that program creating an impact enough are we not repeating the same thing have we become complacent or not are we doing actively something or not and many a time corporate willingly unwillingly have to push you because that is how the law is evolving and it has to evolve government gave us good enough time from 14 to 21 to settle down and gave us those liberty of comply and explain but with garima being here i would like to pose this question to her and understand from your perspective also that why the shift it was comply explain everything was going well we are seeing on the charts on the government side as well the spend is increasing uh, schedule seven areas are being covered and most of the corporates are actively doing it so why the shift from comply and explain to comply and spend so why did that shift happen actually okay yeah. all right thank you uh, firstly i would like to you know thank uh, hcl and nikhil particularly for inviting me here and i'm so happy to see you know such an initiative again i congratulate nidhi to you know make this happen so uh, firstly you know when i when i've been i'll i'll answer your question but you know when you say role of csr in nation building you know i was just thinking that how did you come up with this specific topic you know because nation building for any country is a herculean task and that requires a multi stakeholder approach and therefore i link it you know that from your how you basically design this title of the session itself speaks about the csr intent right that it is basically all the stakeholders be it a regulator the government the funder the corporate and the implementer which is the implementing agency right they have to come together and accelerate this process of nation building right. so firstly you know i i because i try to analyze this particular uh, topic itself now coming to this comply or explain or your specific question i would like to mention that uh, the government works in a very specific way of first having a voluntary things providing a, some sort of a framework and giving a freedom i know right. particularly focusing on the self governance mechanism so there is a freedom given for the companies to decide and do that was when the csr you know mandatory law came into picture there was a framework given now almost after a decade you know there is a sufficient evidence yeah. that the companies have understood everything and they have been doing it well reporting it well and with this you know the creation of these high level committees mm -hmm. in between the second committee also provided the recommendations and those recommendations the government is accepting you know progressively and you know keep on doing the required amendments Right. so basic idea is that government is now monitoring 
they have the data with them you know there is a data analysis which we also do on behalf of mcs think tank right and government also acknowledge the best work done by the companies you know and therefore there is a presidential award and i'm so happy that hcl has been again uh, awarded that particular award uh, secondly i would like to say that the kind of emphasis by the government whether it's a creation of a social you know this national platform wherein you know bringing all the stakeholders together again you can see that it's not just the corporates you know the, earlier we were focusing on that the pooled fund company should come together now there is a portal which highlights that the implementing agency should also come forward and you know provide their best practices highlight so that it is visible for other organization for other implementing agency so with this kind of all the changes you know the government is clear that now there is no more explanation is required hmm. right it is very much deeply rooted in the culture of an organization and therefore we are consciously using the word strategic csr right and i'm sure that everybody will agree all the stakeholders that there is a strong business case for the companies to do it properly to do it you know in a planned way now uh, so so that's that's where the explain is gone and now it's comply and disclosure now again with focus on the disclosure aspect also the recent amendment in september or the 2021 amendment has highlighted you know something like up uh, i mean up is not the political the annual action, annual plan, action plan right <laughs> so annual action plan is there that is again to highlight to have a structured approach you know so that at the end of year you know we used to keep getting calls still few companies call by february that we have this much fund left what to do please connect us with some good ngo we want to spend it we don't want any unspent amount so this kind of you know this annual action plan provides a strategy from the beginning of the year for company to design and uh, decide where exactly they want to uh, you know focus any specific theme also similarly if i also mention you know as a personally not officially like the psus are also very happy with this annual action plan because they get n number of calls you know to spend here and there so once they have this annual action plan they they can't deviate a lot you know so because again there has to be a board approval so the board is still given a flexibility see the board can even in between uh, provide any you know accept any changes can convert a project into an ongoing project so all those changes have been brought with a specific focus that the board has a flexibility now it is understood accepted by all the players all the stakeholders that it is no more just you know explaining that you are unable to do in the beginning years nikhil was there you know there was a hitch people were not aware what to do how to do from where to do now companies have their own foundations their own implementing arm as well as there are n number of implementing agencies which they conduct due diligence before you know enrolling them into this entire process and with this again the september amendment bringing in this section 10 of income tax yes. act is again a very welcome step to widen the scope of implementing agency Absolutely. charitable purpose public religious purpose any institution you know all these are now covered under this particular section 8 so this has again given a very wider scope the intent is again i would say the high level committee uh, has specifically recommended and focus on the impact of csr so now the entire monitoring the entire changes are happening focusing on that you know how to ensure that there is a larger impact on the ground i think with this i have answered your question if anything specific i would love to no, no we heard uh, you know we went ahead and we came to september 20 22 uh, amendments as well where there are changes and of course the scope of ngos have been broadened with new ngos coming in and uh, i would like to hear from nikhil sir now that how easy or difficult it is on the ground sir actually government has its plan it is yeah. very strategically planned uh, we know it was a need of the hour and we keep talking about it that we are growing organically and that is how it should have been but how easy or difficult it is for the ngos yeah. on the ground and how tough it is for the corporate to disseminate this kind of knowledge on the ground so very relevant surbi what you are asking and you know we were former colleague you know when i was in the iica with garima and first of all garima thanks for coming back you know despite all the the traffic on the way 
it was very my interesting what is happening because now i am with the working with corporates and with the ngo sector and when you are on the ground you see whether policy is reaching there or not so when you see some constructive engagement and convergence is happening it is such a such a delight and it gives you so much of happiness that this is the strength of indian democracy because through a democratic process this law was enacted through lok sabha rajya sabha and then the presidential assent right. so i often tell the young indians today that you can do anything in this world understand you all have studied civics in school but we were we've kind of forgotten the strength of the law so we must appreciate first of all section 135 and the game changing thing that happened from 1st of april now coming to a very specific question surbi and also you know hearing what uh, garima just said with the focus on spending and impact and the fact that people are now aware another interesting thing which i am observing from the other side is this that initially the corporate said that are aapne ek aur tax laga diya another right. tax is there slowly slowly they understood the business case to it i also see i have i'm seeing garima on the ground that a lot of young district administrators the dcs aspirational districts program they are leveraging csr amazingly Absolutely. younger lot of politicians are doing it they are going to constituencies to seek votes not on the basis of caste or religion but on the basis of i will get better maths and science for your children give me the vote don't you see an amazing strengthening of democracy at grassroots because of section 135 those are the positives that are happening the counter challenge that i'm seeing um, garima and uh, you know a lot of audiences over here is this that while the annual action plan has been mandated invariably i am and i'm and I'll let me say upfront ethel foundation is one of the exceptions because they were one of the first ones to revise their policy after 22nd of january 2021 and nidhi and the team they all worked and uh, i think it was uploaded also pretty soon in april i guess uh, a lot of corporates are still very lethargic to understand that if the government is now giving asking you to make an annual action plan it in it is actually asking you to prepare and plan better so that in february you don't have a pile of money to spend and then go to iica where do i spend give me an ngo they are still very lethargic on that unfortunately for the corp for the ngos i am finding they are in invariably when we are traveling around the country i am finding a many of them are not aware about the finer nuances of section 135 and since majority of your ngos over here you have to understand this and as garima representing uh, you know the iic and the government point of view it is the most enabling legislation let me tell you even if i be critical uh, you can be critical in a positive sense so for us as ngos we must understand the enablement over there and our own internal governance should try to align with the fact that i should raise my proposals and get my sanctions in such a way that the annual action plan can kick in and synchronize with the financial year cycle so synchronization of the grant cycle with the financial year cycle is the key to ensuring the spending of money by 31st of march when you don't do that because of lack of planning and then an amendment comes in everybody begins to cry foul you because the actually you are not understanding the the nature of the game so when you ask me this question surbi and since i am on the on this side now with with corporates and um, uh, and working with a lot of governments also um, um, garima uh, i am finding that the chief ministers offices are having special cells on csr they often have secretary level officers you know manning these cells and engaging with corporates and working with ngos you have goa csr authority you have gujarat csr authority uh, you have niti ayog working very closely on csr so for the ngos who are sitting here these are amazing times let me tell you and the, the latest amendment that came in september 2022 and as garima just said section 1023c brings in another uh, you know group of kind of institutions to come and play the game and so you need to either have a 12a or a 1023c and plus an 80g for sure so that you can enter the game so the challenge surbi is this where uh, uh, the the ngos have to understand that they must be more proactive in the learning process and the corporates need to be very agile also business mein log bag kafi use karte hain they use a word agile especially after covid people were using the word agile hybrid even in csr for for understanding compliances and aligning to them you need to be agile and alert and then you will actually be able to leverage the positive that is being tried to be uh, to be promoted by the government through the amendment uh, right. otherwise you you become you take a defensive stance why this true so i'll take it forward from here sir and i like to understand from garima 
what are the various initiatives that government has taken for the ngos like darpan portal being one of them or csr.gov.in being one of them where you get to access the data but what are the other portals or other facilities that government is providing where a proactive agile ngo without the help of a corporate can come to know about the latest amendment when what is it that is needed from him he can be abreast with that right so uh, dr surbi firstly you know as i mentioned that there is now very recently this national csr platform is there which which brings all the ngos implementing agencies in front that you know these are the people who are actually doing the project and because of you know they play a key role in ensuring the impact secondly uh, the disclosure so right. the mca 21 or the reporting disclosures which uh, as per the 21 amendment ask the information about implementing agencies also absolutely so that's again a very welcome step you know to to ensure that they are you know they they both go hand in hand we cannot say that uh, implementing agencies and corporates are two sides of the coin they are one side of the coin absolutely right so absolutely. with with this kind of a relationship only there can be an impact thirdly uh, during the high level committee since iica provided the technical support you know we have taken a uh, lot of inputs specifically with the ngo group right okay. so all those suggestions there were some you know suggestions for administrative overheads there was something on you know expanding this there was something on how to uh, how to highlight that their best practices then somebody also said to wave off this three year you know uh, uh, requirement so hlc has analyzed all this so the point is that the government is clear that this is a important pillar and without these people there cannot be an impact Absolutely. of the csr so every process this has been involved i would not say that specifically something is done for them it's a strategically made a part of the entire csr framework mm -hmm. i mean that's what i would like to say so garima you were talking about the uh, disclosures uh, the direct in the director's report again we saw few changes over there a lot of information is being omitted now yeah and uh, but we have all those requirements are still there in the csr form 2 so what shall corporate expect from there now you know so do we expect anything any any new amendments are on the way if you can just let us know anything about it i w i would be able to say any new amendment but yeah some uh, some information some redundant questions have been removed rather there is not you know the latest amendments is not much information about all the ongoing projects right, right. so uh, those changes will be reflected upon those csr form also because amendment has a process as nikhila said law is a you know process it can't be a two people sitting in the room and deciding what to be done right. so this if this has been already you know uh, notified hmm. then the necessary changes will be definitely brought into the csr form uh, to also great great so i believe with that agility the mca has become more agile with lot of amendments <laughs> every few yeah, months so we have lot of changes over here if i am just allowed so hlc if i if we read the hlc report you know yeah there are still many recommendations which so as i said mc has ensured progressively you know incorporate we i mean the government should not come up with suddenly something new and then again people are lost that what has happened entirely it has to be a gradual shift you know the way the we have moved from comply or explain to comply or disclose similarly this has to be in a very phased manner uh, right. probably and then there is a constant you know review is happening probably very soon now the new hlc will be formed right so right. they they will again analyze all these changes as well right. and uh, so the the law always says that something uh, something voluntary as a best practice to start and nikhil was there at that time so you know how it has started and it has evolved now and it has become a part of the you know the to give back to the society now i would also if you allow me would like to just add something which nikhil has also said about the role of state you know and the district administrative that is again a very crucial thing right. uh, and the mca is also very much concerned about you know collaborative effort because uh, it's it's as very yeah. positive i am finding because i am working with district collectors in very remote areas 
and i am finding that they are they are able to talk to me about say section 135 3k clause isme what how how should i interpret this i feel very happy when the dc is asking me that question yeah. because it means that he or she is reading it yes it has percolated and uh, the dc is also understanding that the money will not go into the dc's coffer the government coffers mm. or the money, the government treasury it has to be either a direct implementation by the corporate or through an implementing partner which could be a trust society or a 18 or a section 8 company so that is a, an amazing yeah. change i am finding and uh, uh, young is officers you know uh, men and women they are applying their mind and even uh, i think a lot of politicians i am finding are seeking votes yeah. uh, on the basis of development agenda True. so i was just mentioning maybe that was prior to you came uh, that strengthening of indian democracy has kind of is beginning to take shape in a very different way with this section 135 that was right. this almost again, a decade old now according to what uh, dr garima said in the beginning that uh, annual action plan is a welcome change by corporate yes, though it yes. was a herculean task initially uh, any change is difficult but i think that is that has given them a cover yeah, from the yeah. government now right. similarly now when the dcs come and they know that okay there right. has to be an implementing agency in between and with the annual action plans in place So in both. fact Surbi when i'm seeing the last 8 years so initially the corporates came on board because it actually first hit them on 1st of april 2014 because they had to make a csr policy mm. they had to allocate that because they were hit the first then i'm finding so they were they were on boarded slowly slowly then i'm finding that the governments have become on boarded the more proactive ones were first setting up their own like the gujarat csr authority yeah. we go to their website right. they are the first ones to come on board right. huh? now i am finding that the agile and the alert politicians are using csr to win elections and strengthening so, democracy so on the development agenda if we if we may say this you know csr triad which is the corporate the district administration yeah. and the implementing agency you know right. coming Absolutely. all these three together and let me also share with you that you know we are already in the process of developing the csr partnership guidelines oh uh, very good which very will good. become provide some sort of a specific framework bare minimum hmm. uh, you know and kind, that kind will, of a guideline that, which can yeah, be very useful that will useful. strengthen this collaboration because yeah, now yeah. as you said now companies are not saying that it is a tax burden or it is not at all, neither not at all. they are saying that go it is government job development is government's mm. role mm. we have no role so that days are gone mm. now the state government or the district you know going more local district authorities yeah. are joining hand with the corporate to you know ensure that the development agenda has a higher impact you know Absolutely. it's a better impact and with this you know even this um the the cap on the impact assessment has also been revised yeah yeah 2% which yeah, is like now 2% or 50 lakh like higher, higher, higher whichever is higher right. because lot many big companies were coming that we have a n number of projects hmm. you expect us to get it all done with 50 lakh so yeah. we will go with somebody who has who has the reports ready and just change the cover page so right. you know the the intent is very clear that the government is clear to hear out to regularly monitor right. and to strengthen the entire partnership and uh, i i think we'll be able to provide the first draft in next 5 6 be, months in fact surbi yeah. before we forget i would request all of you to make a note please download the high level committee report of august 2019 just mark it just read it it's a it's a detailed report a lot of data analysis is there and it has got all the recommendations if there are 20 recommendations you will find that 10 or 12 have been implemented in the january 2021 thing some more has been implemented in the september 2022 one and some more may be coming in future so if you read the report you are at least preparing for the future a smart guy prepares for the future so if your ngo leaders ngo program managers prepare like a chess player you have to strategize if i have my an organization of this size this is my turnover and these were the this is the recommendation and this is where it looks like going right can i not prepare right now because then if tomorrow the new circular comes i will not say are what is this that is what i was going to so say read. that read that is very very important i was going through csr compendium last night and there's so much over there go through the website go through the faqs most of the informations are there and i think we got the answer that we were asking from dr garima that how can we be proactive so yes high level committee's draft report is the or the report is the one which is Absolutely. the key to the most of the amendments so instead of asking both of you now i'll ask my yeah. audience to open up and ask anything that you would like to understand about just give us 5 minutes because i believe yeah 
एनीबॉडी हैविंग एनी क्वेश्चन एनीबॉडी हु वुड लाइक टू अंडरस्टैंड एनीथिंग फ्रॉम द गवर्नमेंट्स पर्सपेक्टिव और एनीथिंग रिलेवेंट टू द सीएसआर कंप्लायंसेस नो क्वेश्चंस आई थिंक आवर एकेडमी इज डूइंग प्रीटी वेल वी आर डूइंग अ कोर्स आल्सो एज आई सेड एट 5:00 o'clock you can't expect much questions <laughs> i believe hello hello yes here up yes i think somebody here here here, here sir here up balcony oh okay, sorry sorry yeah. yes <laughs> sanjay gupta thank ah, you ma'am uh, for the wonderful um, uh, appraising about the system just wanted to understand how the data which we feed as an ngo to hcl foundation and then goes to the government system how you present uh, data to the higher ups or how the, the system of data which is pulled in various forums through ngos through corporates at various forums how at your level data is processed and presented at the higher level so you know fortunately government has no role here the company fills up the mca 21 form right and there are disclosure format given to the company so the hcl fills the data and it directly comes to the mca uh, so for example we, there are clear columns of spent and all the disclosure format as you can see so the government only receives it uh, no then they ask us to analyze the data yeah. for example so honorable prime an, minister as when say that uh, the india is doing this much that much or any minister when they say that ha, this is happening so we analyze the data whatever the parliamentary question comes or whatever the new you know amendment has to be brought in so with the basis of those figures we try to come up with you know what have, what is happening where the csr spend is thematic so that kind of a research as a as a research we do but we do not have a control over input so we just analyze the output i think so, so i don't know how so many of you are aware you can go to the government site and uh, take out a report company wise report state wise report thematic area wise report yeah. and all the reports are available you just need to punch in the year the company name the district the state and you'll get all those reports and i think that is how it is compiled you know the information that is filled by so the company i have a question from dr garima garima i am working in various you know remote areas um, through an ngo and uh, working with the civil administration which is not part of the dc's office eh? and this is an aspirational district i am getting a sense that when i am sending data as my ngo to this donor and the donor is filling the mca which you just said now the dc is unaware about the project i am sensing that now the dc is also sending this aspirational district data report to the niti ayog sdg dashboard so is there any convergence or mapping or tallying between what the dc is submitting to the sdg dashboard and what the mca is collating because it appears to me that maybe in some cases more is being done and maybe all of it is not getting mapped that's a great feedback and i see in in hlc report also this has been discussed acha has so, yeah. okay because so i'm any, actually finding this yeah, and i'm it, realizing that maybe we are achieving more targets as per absolutely. the decade of action and to be reported to the un sdg goals than what is coming across in the niti ayog report because in my district also when i i'm trying to invite the dc he is not able to come and visit so obviously he is not reporting it also yeah. because he is unaware and i am reporting it as an ngo submitting it to the donor yeah. which is filling the mca 21 yeah. which is coming into csr.gov.in yeah. so i guess if the niti ayog dashboard That's converges with mca.gov has to be there yes initially we integrated schedule 7 with sdg ha. and i think if that happens it might suddenly see a yeah. jump in the achievement of some of the goals that are in the sdgs so i duplicacy think. of data can also be yes. removed and yes. sometimes something you yes. know some something might be missed out at the sdg Absolutely. dashboard but the company the 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 funder will certainly ensure that this reaches to mca uh -huh. so i would say that mca receives the maximum whatever Absolutely. is That, Absolutely, but yeah, to for that level, the integration Because is maybe, important. Because maybe, maybe, uh, Karima, yeah. what could happen is in your partnership guidelines that you are yeah, bringing, maybe. if the DC's office begins to partner the other civil department in that district, whether aspirational or non-aspirational, mm -hmm. maybe the partnership guideline will compel the donors, yeah. NGO, and the DC to sit together for a day and exchange data. Yeah. Certainly, we have that particular Haan. specific format. It has to integrate Haan. with Niti Aayog and the, because you know, otherwise, who can I sort be? Yeah, yeah, we were discussing that yes. other day yeah. as well. Yes. That yes. multiple tasks are being held, yeah. and they are not converging together. So Haan. maybe we are seeing so more bit, impact than what is actually happened, reported as. But though quite a bit has huge has happened, when I can tell you that. But if these gaps can be plugged, I guess okay. it can okay. suddenly uh, take our outcomes to another level. I feel. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Any sorry. next question, please? Yes. 
हाय एवरीवन माय नेम इज मोहम्मद जुबैर एंड आई एम फ्रॉम ह्यूमाना पीपल टू पीपल इंडिया एंड माय क्वेश्चन इज अबाउट दी कम्प्लाइंसिस वी आर इम्प्लीमेंटिंग ए प्रोजेक्ट वेयर वी हैव इंस्टॉल्ड सोलर इनेबल्ड आर ओ इन ए विलेज एंड वी आर वर्किंग इन पार्टनरशिप विद वन ऑफ द कॉरपोरेट्स and uh, we suggested that uh, for the sustainability of this uh, uh, solar ro we need some maintenance and for that maintenance we should collect some money from the uh, community and then corporate said no we cannot collect money because that will be a compliance issue and then uh, we gave up because we did not have a answer to say so uh, my question is that what will you guide us like i really think that we should collect money something from the community so it is long term and sustainable because we are not there forever we are maybe for that 3 years and then maybe next 2 year more so after 5 uh, years there will be definitely some maintenance it's a big investment in the ro but then if we don't collect and then community don't take initiative then it will not be sustainable so what will you gui uh, guide us on this uh, sustain means uh, compliance part you would like to take this question sir so i would say um, you what is your good name mohammad zubair mohammad so suppose when you start taking from the community so there is a there is a csr obligation is like 2% plus surplus minus set off okay so if you take something from the community and maybe put it into a project uh, because what you need to report to the donor is the money that the donor is giving you that the corporate is giving you right but definitely keep them informed that on the basis of this project you're not raising your own revenues and whatever so maybe if you are able to while the donor is on those 3 years and if you start raising it say from the second year keep spending that money also because maybe you can show it as a surplus out of the project action that is happening because that sir because that csr project is still on for 3 years legally right but you are building your own capacity towards sustainability so that when the donor goes this kicks in so while the donor is on maybe spend all of that 100 plus x also and tell the donor the donor would i think maybe included as a surplus because though it is not like a um, um, a tax so sorry and a savings bank interest but while the project is on it is like a community contribution which could be a co called as a surplus also no harm in spending it now the donor goes away and then the x could magnify to become 100 plus x that should be fine i guess are you it all depends on the corporate policy also sir because uh -huh. otherwise it is allowed as per compliance as i believe so but maybe i would, I would call it should be fall into the 3 years ha uh -huh. so if it is part is so when the, the project is on the rules are very clear right i think it will be obligation is 2% plus surplus minus set off sorry to interject i have a solution ask them for the maintenance as well then ha uh, but they may not give <laughs> they may uh, say ki we will give you so his query is that suppose they have budget as 100 and you are also giving me the gyan of sustainability So many how do I times, become sustainable from the? So what happens actually many <laughs> a times at just last minute? Ah, uh, uh, sorry. Many a times it may happen that uh, when the corporates, as I was said, we were talking in the morning also, uh, that compliances should be an enabler and not a an hindrance. You know, yeah. many a time when corporates is okay, you are talking about five year plan. No, no, we cannot commit because we can just commit for three year plan. So you have to talk to the corporate accordingly, and you can moderate the plans and the programs accordingly. Then, yeah. right? and in this specific case it will be in part of surplus while the project is on yes please hello uh, hi good evening this is devasis and i am from pradhan hi i have uh, a very basic sorry uh, sorry to cut you short uh, cut you in between i would just like to uh, uh, shed a slight light at what we do at excel foundation so we have many projects that we uh, implement uh, which uh, require maintenance and for that operation and maintenance charges are taken from the community so it's about how you structure the asset absolutely. absolutely so you have to structure the asset as a donated asset to the community first of all once it is a donated asset to the community now community can uh, implement a user charge on that for operation and maintenance so none of the money is going back to the uh, csr uh, funder so as far as csr funder then like us is concerned uh, it is immaterial to us uh, whatever the fund is being collected as long as there is a proper entity which is owning the asset and we on our books have shown it as a donated asset to that entity 
it is a community owned uh, community entity and that community like if you am doing something in a gram panchayat so i am building suppose say uh, water system in a gram panchayat the water system will not be sustainable unless certain level of user charges are taken from the uh, beneficiaries who are getting the water from there so the gram panchayat as a owner of the asset and we as a funder who has donated that asset to the gram panchayat can authorize the gram panchayat to collect operation and maintenance charges on that asset and that money does not come back to us that money is, remains with that entity like uh, it is a gram panchayat so then they can use it so in your case if there is some community for which you have set it up that community can charge operation and maintenance on that asset thank you thank you so much okay yes. uh, so last question i have a very basic day. question man just it is coming in my mind when this interaction was happening uh, how this 2% come into the calculation <laughs> wow. okay. so, so that so is coming in my mind yeah so okay. i i was there at that time in the ministry so there was yeah. a standing committee of the parliament um, i think dr yashwan sinha was the head of that committee lot of debates were there and somewhere this formula came <laughs> beyond that we also really don't know and uh, i think various options were proposed maybe what they thought was something which could be like a not too much of a burden but a catalytic amount also so that there is some substance to it but not it shouldn't become like a corporate tax because corporates are also paying their taxation yeah so there is a section 198 in which this net profit calculation is deeply explained so you must also read section 198 when you are reading this eligibility and the calculation and then ashish 2% of 2 crore is much higher than 2% of 2000 you know so automatically so it bigger ka budget, budget bhi bada hi hoga Haan, so there was your question is a valid one but there was a debate and discussion and they arrived at keeping a lot of these things in mind because you have to also remember if you did too much of it then the corporates in the beginning were as it is getting a bit upset ki you are putting in another tax or if yeah. you make it so less that it is insignificant then also it may not so there was a balance basically so this is a bare minimum you know one can do more at least it says it also. says at least it says at least <laughs> says yes so we have one more question Uh, huh. good evening everyone so uh, sir very quick so in 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 uh, latest amendment i mean uh, ministry has uh, asked not to submit that ongoing project detail and all those so is there any any other channel or how will ministry know that in which location how much is getting is spent i mean the consolidated way or how schedule 7 expenditure are done on which schedule what is being spent no 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 there is uh, the channel the disclosure is there only that only the point is that the companies have basically provided a written feedback that this is a humongous task for you know provide such a lengthy details about the ongoing projects and all that but certainly as previously also the disclosure format asked about the location right and i always you know whenever i meet a corporate i say don't write pan india you know write it specifically otherwise how will we analyze the data the big companies write pan india one word you are done with the compliance so that should not happen because of that this uh, we asked about the detailed information but based on the feedback received that this is a little tedious task to do this has been accepted. but i think vinith and maybe uh, garima just correct me if i am wrong maybe if the government has simplified it it doesn't mean that we don't keep our back end worksheets ready because tomorrow if there is a query they might go deeper because suppose yeah. you, very but, right the query so comes and the we do so if the end ask. if the end format is simplified yeah. doesn't kind of mean that we are not keeping our back sheets ready and fine, fine. In, in, in even this annual action plan is going to help you a lot on that you know at the end Absolutely. where you have Absolutely. spent so it's Thank it's you. the same thing we are asking the information in the annual action plan ha wo wahan bhi hai